Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ben Mason. I'm an employment partner based at the Shrewsbury office, as you can tell by my, my rather Midlands accent. Um, just to endorse um, Helen's comments earlier, it's lovely to see everybody today. I remember last year doing the roadshow from my small office uh, at home in, in Cannock. So it's nice to be out here seeing people and, and seeing so many of us turned up. Um, and the comments from the people I've spoke to are very much endorsing that as well. So thank you everybody for, for sort of turning up in person. Um, it, it's lovely to see everybody here. Um, what I'll be talking about is covering issues regarding um, COVID, about vaccinations, vaccination policies. So going through just some of the, the issues surrounding that. Um, I'll be here all day, so more than happy to, to sort of take questions either during the break or at lunchtime because obviously with some of the, the new announcements from the government there are particular issues going forward over the next month or so which I'm more than happy to, to sort of ask, ask, answer questions on uh, in the breaks if that helps. So for employers, we've been battling with COVID since March 2020. Um, anybody who's dealt with employment in HR remembers every Friday afternoon getting the updated guidance, um, having to deal with that. Um, there's some smiles around the room there. Um, dealing with the lockdowns, dealing with furlough. Um, this has been going on for, for a long period of time. So hopefully um, we'll be making our way out of that um, soon. But just going back sort of on the timeline really in respect to vaccinations. So just highlighting some of the dates here in respect of NHS delivering the first COVID vaccination on the 8th of December 2020, which seems a long time ago now. Um, the rollout of the vaccines in care homes, um, that was on the 20th of December. And then skipping forward somewhat, we had in November 2021, the government promised that everybody would be boosted by no later than January 2022. So we have come a long way since those early lockdowns and, and there are sort of further guidances coming out from the government and things that have come over in the last month, which I'll be talking about, but hopefully we can see uh, through the, the sort of the trees to, to the way out on the other side um, and hopefully we can make our way towards that. So initially I'll be talking about some of the issues regarding um, vaccination status and the GDPR issues surrounding that. So there could you know, there could be issues even just asking somebody their vaccination status. Um, why would employers want to know about vaccination status? It will depend very much on your sector and, and what you do as an organisation. But you may wish to, for example, track the status across the workforce, look at health and safety policies that you're looking to implement, etc. So there may be very valid reasons as to why you're doing that, but you do need to consider why you're doing that before you do ask for vaccination status um, information. You need to do that because it's special category data. Um, you need to have a lawful basis for doing that. Um, previously, before GDPR, you would have looked at things like consent, and we're unlikely to be looking at that now. So really, the, the only particular reason you'd be doing so is on um, legitimate employer interest. Again, looking at health and safety, maybe absence management, etc. So that would be your lawful basis for actually processing that information. We then need a condition for processing that information. So again, looking maybe in respect of health and safety obligations, why is it that you need, what's your condition for actually processing that information? Um, and what the IOC guidance is all about is it's not just asking people because you want to know and you want to sort of um, put that on the record and it's, it's on a why do you want to know that, what, what do you need that information for. So have a think before you ask the question as to what, what it is you're asking the question for. How long can you then keep the information? Well again the ICO guidance is you only need to um, think about processing if you are actually keeping information. So if you're just doing a check of somebody's status and you're not recording that information, well, that wouldn't be under GDPR anyway. But it seems pointless in doing that if you've got no log of, of, of how that makes sense or what, what are we doing that for. So firstly, we'll need to look at how long we can keep the information for, and the ICO guidance is for as short a period as possible, and you need to be able to justify why you're actually keeping that record for. So again, having that consideration prior to getting the information and then at every point after that as to why you're keeping the information as well. As I mentioned, this is all sort of ICO guidance. So some of the other guidance is your reasoning for, for um, so recording the status. 
it must be clear and relevant. So again, informing the staff as to why you are actually taking that, that information from them and why it's relevant in, in the circumstances you're asking for it. You should only be asking for the minimum amount of data necessary in order for the reasons set out as to why you're asking for the information. The people being made aware should be kept to a minimum, so not telling the whole of your workforce who, who's been vaccinated and who hasn't. Keep it within the, the, the necessary need to know basis, whether it's your HR department, if you're a small business, just the directors or management level. It doesn't need to be put on a, a table scoring board as to who's, who's vaccinated and who's not. It mustn't then result in any unfair or justif unjustified treatment. And the data must only be used in ways which the employee would reasonably expect it to be used. And if any employee is at high risk of, of data usage affecting them, then you need to do a data protection impact assessment um, as soon as possible. So that's really highlighting some of the issues in just asking for, for vaccination status and the information. Um, again, I appreciate that. I could do a whole subject on that particular issue. So again, if there are any questions on that, I'm more than happy to pick those up either during the break or, or at lunchtime. So some further issues really in regards to not only asking staff to be vaccinated, but, but requesting that they are and making it mandatory. We've got some issue, issues on the board there as to discrimination issues, but there are also, um, if you're saying to people, you must be vaccinated, and if not, we're either gonna take disciplinary action or potentially dismiss you, obviously there are huge inherent risks in doing that. Now, in respect of dismissal, you'd need to have a fair reason. Um, the, the particular fair reasons in these cases would range between capability, potentially, um, because uh, it's a physical or mental quality. So, although I probably wouldn't be using that as, as my fair reason, it, it's a potential issue there that you could look at. The main, the main fair reason would be based on misconduct where you would, as an employer, would be arguing that it's a reasonable instruction from an employer to request that that person be vaccinated, and it's an unreasonable, um, unreasonable um, in respect of them not doing that. So again, I think in respect of where we are currently at in, in, the, in the COVID timeline, some of the um, mandatory vaccination schemes in respect of care homes, etc., which I'll come on with later, they've all been revoked as of today. So again, you as an employer taking the decision to now look at mandatory vaccination, I think it would be, depending on the circumstances of your business and what you do, would be quite difficult in being able to show that that would be reasonable in respect of any misconduct dismissal. Again, I'm more than happy to discuss that through because it is a topic on its own, but I would certainly take advice before you do anything like that in respect of your individual circumstances of a business. Another potential is to look at some of the substantial reason dismissal. Some of the potential reasons that, that come under SSS, SOSR are, for example, changes to terms and conditions. So you're saying now that it is now a term of your employment to have the vaccination. Again, there are issues around that of potentially terminating everybody's employment and then re-engaging them on that new term. So there's all sorts of issues around that, but that is a potential reason for dismissal. Maybe pressure from third parties like clients or customers to say that they're not prepared to do any business with you if you have any unvaccinated staff. Again, take advice, but that's a potential reason. We have potentially reputation risk of you continuing to employ people who are unvaccinated, um, something to consider in that regard. And potentially maybe a breakdown in trust and confidence where you're asking somebody to take the vaccination and they're not prepared to do so. Your argument is there's a breakdown in trust and confidence between you and the employee. So again, that's a huge topic and I'm more than happy to pick up questions from you. Uh, but moving along really in respect of some of the discrimination issues, um, the EHRC is, is concerned at creating a two-tier society and they have been throughout COVID in respect of vaccinated and unvaccinated being able to do different things and having different rights. So what their, their sort of stance on this is a, a blanket policy applied inflexibly is likely to be unlawful. So again, looking at what policy you're trying to bring in and then again, looking at whether that's just an inflexible policy of everybody must be vaccinated regardless um, is, is, a, is unlikely to be lawful. We're then looking at things like direct discrimination. Um, so again, requiring vaccination of a specific employee or treating them unfavorably could directly be um, discrimination. And then more likely to be the case is potential claims for indirect discrimination 
where the requirement of, of the vaccination would potentially be a, a PCP. And then you're looking at the potential issues around what protected status individuals would, would bring claims. So maybe um, on disability grounds, because they, they're disabled and therefore they, they don't consider that they could actually have the vaccination. Maybe to do with sex and maternity, pregnancy, um, alongside race or, or religion or belief grounds. Um, and we've got up there in respect of sort of anti-vaxxers being a pot potential religious or belief. Um, and the Granger and Nicholson case um, in respect of climate change. Again, those are potential issues that if you're going to provide a requirement that everybody be vaccinated, you need to take those types of consideration into account before doing so. And then what I think it was Claire who mentioned in respect of the justification of doing these things. So you may well have a legitimate aim that you're looking after the health and safety of staff or customers, etc., in bringing out a mandatory vaccination requirement. But the, the second limb of that really is in regards to whether it's proportionate means of achieving that legitimate aim. And again, going back to the stance at the moment of where we are on the timeline of COVID, what the government stance is, etc., you might find it difficult in saying that requiring everybody to have a vaccine is, is, is therefore proportionate and it's necessary. And again, that's something to weigh up. Again, individual circumstances apply, but generically, that's something you'll need to consider. And that's something that the, that the most likely claim will come under in respect of an indirect discrimination claim. You've then got the issues potentially on recruitment. So asking the question at recruitment stage as to whether somebody is vaccinated. That is again, an, another issue that you might wish to take some advice upon before doing. But asking health questions prior to a job offer is potentially discriminatory, depending on the, the limitations and, and limited circumstances. Again, is it intrinsic to the role that you know that person's vaccination status? Depending on the circumstances, but it's going to be unlikely that that's going to be the case, depending on, on the role of the individual. Some other issues in respect of requesting staff to be vaccinated are human rights issues. And those human rights we're considering here really are Article 8, the right to privacy, and Article 9, the right to freedom of thought, religion and conscience. So again, the scope here, if, if I'm an employee, to argue it's an invasion of my human rights to be required to be vaccinated. And there have been a number of cases in regards to this. Um, Vavrika is the Czech Republic case, which is nothing to do with employment law necessarily, but is mandatory vaccination of children. Um, it's not even COVID related, but on the basis of it's mandatory to have vaccinations, nine of them for, for children in Czech Republic, a case was brought in respect of that being a, a breach of human rights. And that, was, that failed that claim in respect of it being justified to have the mandatory vaccinations in that particular scenario. So that's just something for you to look at in respect of um, endorsing your issue in respect of whether it's a human rights claim. And another uh, claim, which was a let which is an employment claim in, in the UK. Again, the claimant there failed in respect to the human rights claim, although actually it was stated that it was a breach of the Article um, 8, but it was, um, it was actually a requirement was proportionate in that scenario. And in that particular case, it was before mandatory vaccinations were brought in um, in respect to the care sector. And in that individual situation, the individual, um, unfortunately, the, the employer could not get insurance to cover COVID-related issues, and the employee um, would, not, would not take the vaccination. So they went through a full process. They consulted and tried to persuade the individual, but on the basis that they couldn't get insurance unless she, she was to, ha to be vaccinated, they decided to dismiss. And on those particular grounds, in that particular case, I'm, I'm adding, the, the employer was successful in defending an unfair dismissal claim and a wrongful dismissal claim based on those particular circumstances. So if you are going to move forward with any type of um, mandatory vaccination scheme, there is a potential there that they can be de defended on the basis of that particular case, but that was very specific in respect of where the height of COVID was at that stage, and it was just before mandatory vaccinations were brought in. So that may not be sort of the same, the same outcome now in respect of where we are on the, on the um, timeline. So I mentioned sort of the mandatory scheme in respect of, of care homes. The government brought in the land legislation for mandatory vaccination um, and from the 11th of November 2021, individuals must be double vaccinated or they weren't allowed to enter care homes, which effectively meant that those individuals could be dismissed under the grounds of a statutory restriction. 
There were, were some potential issues in regards to GDP. The GDP are there, but the lawful basis was because it was in regards to a statutory restriction, a legal obligation to request that information. The reason I'm highlighting that is it might be you think, well, actually, I can ask these questions in respect to vaccinated status because there's a legal obligation to do so. Well, there was only a legal obligation at that point when it was actually a legal obligation that, that they were mandated to be, to be vaccinated. So that argument wouldn't work again now. So again, just think about the reasons for asking for vaccination status because it won't be on the basis of a legal obligation. There were lots of negatives surrounding the, um, the initial consultation. Care homes, as Ikram has stated, were already um, low on staff, skilled staff as well. The, there was um, already people leaving in respect of Brexit where care home workers potentially going back to their, their European countries. So there was already a lack of workers and obviously then employers having to dismiss people. And we, we dealt with a lot of clients who were having to dismiss people that unfortunately were very skilled. They were long, um, long service employees. They did not want to dismiss them. But unfortunately, because of the rules brought in, they had to. Um, and that was quite a sad, a sad sort of end in respect of many of, of those employees' termination of, the, of their employment. But um, that, uh, that legislation has now been revoked as of today, um, unless anything's changed this morning and they have a chance to, to check. But therefore, moving forward, um, that, that, that legislation will no longer be in place. Which takes me on to the NHS and social care, the regulations in that were that on the 1st of April it was planned that all frontline staff must have the two doses or similarly could be dismissed on the grounds of a statutory restriction. There were large scale protests um, in the Arndale Centre in Manchester. Uh, many NHS staff turned out in respect of, again, there was already a great issue with staffing within the NHS sector. Um, people, again, following Brexit, going back to European countries. So obviously about to dismiss a lot of people um, was going to be uh, problematic um, for the NHS. And again, the government has now decided to revoke this legislation as stated that anybody who is currently working their notice or has been dismissed should be offered their, their roles back in, in the organisation. So again, going back to where we are on the COVID guideline and the, and the timeline, that sort of shows us where the government are trying to go. And again, going back to the the potential of you now bringing in a new mandatory vaccination scheme would be sort of a risky manoeuvre based on where we're currently at, depending on your, your sector. So looking maybe therefore at non-mandatory vaccination policies and what you can do to try and encourage staff to have the vaccination without making it mandatory. That's what the government are now encouraging. They're encouraging the staff and encouraging businesses to get the staff vaccinated, to provide information, to provide a flow of how it can be done and the reasons for it, etc. And therefore, you as, as employers may wish to maybe have a policy, put it in place in respect of trying to encourage those people who still haven't been vaccinated to get that done. So in, in any such policy, which you may wish to create, you might look at the purpose. So what is the, why are you creating the policy? Well, it's all going to be about promoting awareness and, and promoting the reasons for the vaccination and how we can um, look after the health and safety of other staff and potentially of, of clients and customers. You may wish to discuss in the policy pay in respect of there's no legislation or right to pay while people are having the, the, the vaccination, for example, if they're having to take the morning off work to get vaccinated. There's no, there's no legislative requirement for that person to be paid. So again, you may wish to think about if you're looking to try and get staff to be encouraged to, to, to take the vaccination, then taking away some of those barriers, it might be you're stating, well, if you're having the vaccination, then we will pay you for the time off you're having. Again, just something to consider um, and consider that when you're creating any such policy. You might wish to sort of think about the data protection issues in respect of, again, if you're trying to get people to be vaccinated, how you're then going to process that information and how you're going to request that information and what are your reasons for doing that, what I've already really discussed earlier on today. very unlikely that you're looking to dismiss someone in breach of a non-mandatory um, vaccination policy. It's what we're talking about here is a voluntary policy. We're looking at promoting awareness. Um, so uh, I, I would say it's unlikely that anybody would breach it because it's voluntary and it's unlikely therefore you're going to be looking to dismiss. This is more really in respect of going back to what I was saying earlier, respect of that mandatory 
policy vaccination of just considering is this something that you need is this something that the business needs or requires and looking as to why you'd be doing that and looking at fair reasons for dismissing individuals and really having that consideration before just implementing a, a blanket policy on that so what does the future look like well in february the government provided more guidance in respect of coming out of COVID, which I mentioned at the very start of my talk. And this is something you may wish to maybe have a chat with me after or, or seek some advice on as I speaking to some people beforehand, is there may be some issues in respect of what you're doing between now and the 1st of April in respect of SSP, um, in respect of PCR tests. So for example, um, the, the, new, the new guidance is that from the 24th of Fe February, you are no longer required to isolate legally. There's no longer a legal requirement to notify your employer if you need to isolate. SSP changes will, will be made from the 24th of March, so from that date, SSP will no longer be available um, from day one. So the waiting days will come back into play. And from the 1st of April, PCR tests will no longer be free. So this does highlight some potential issues that you as employers are going to have. For example, I was talking to some people beforehand as to whether you're still requiring people to test um, and if so, if you're requiring people to test from the 1st of April, are you going to be paying for those tests? Or are you going to be expecting employees to pay for their own tests to continue testing? Again, that creates a problem as to if you're making people um, test and you're not paying for them, is there likely to be an issue there and, and, and some issues surrounding that? In respect of SSP, for example, it might be that an individual should be isolating because they live with somebody with COVID and therefore, if they're not going to get SSP, are they likely to notify you or are they likely just to come into work because you're not going to pay them for that period? And therefore, that's something again to consider as to if you're looking to encourage people to, to be vaccinated, if you're looking to try and get people back into work, but also looking, trying to look after your workforce. And if people have got COVID or if people are living with people with COVID and they realise that if they're not going to come into work, they're not going to be paid, then you may wish to consider how that's going to affect you, how you're going to be able to police that and how you're going to be able to look after your workforce. Therefore, look into consideration of policies as to whether you are thinking about contractual sick pay for people who have to isolate, all of those types of things that are going to be issues. And at the moment, the new guidance is expected from the 1st of April, but obviously SSP changes come in on the 24th of March. So is that gap between any new guidance we may have on this subject and some issues that may arise in the meantime, and obviously looking into PCR tests in respect of payment from the 1st of April, being the 15th of March 2022, have I got the date right? Um, that is 15 days now for you to consider whether you're going to be um, paying for people's tests, etc. So a lot for you to consider moving forward. Again, more than happy to, to take questions on that either at the break or, or thereafter.